what does a square tell us about functional programming and the web? It's just a shape, but so is a triangle, a circle, and a line. With these shapes, you can draw just about anything. You can draw a conversation between two cats. You could group some thoughts together. And you can shed some light on an idea. For some of us, it's the web and functional programming that's simple while drawing something on a piece of paper and showing it to someone else is the hard part. Sometimes a blank page can be intimidating. Where do you start? It's a blank page. Drawing some lines can help you divide your page into sections. You'll find that some talks fit nicely into neat sections, while other talks flow in more of a circle with the speaker returning to a certain point and fanning out. It's important to remember that sketching is not about art in any way, but only about making really bad drawings with a few simple shapes. We hope you feel like drawing with us today, and the plan is to give you a talk that's both technically dense, maybe to the point to overwhelm. But this is when going back to a simple shape, such as a square, circle, or triangle, can help, you, can help to give you a new perspective on what you're trying to understand. If you're wondering where to start drawing, let's start with a square. This is a square, but it can be something else as well. This square is a black box that takes input and creates new output. We could also call this black box a function. It has an input and an output. Everything that is happening only happens in the black box. There are no side effects. When we provide the same inputs, we get the same output. When we change the input, we get different output. This function is what we call idempotent. A function's output can feed into another function. Once you're at this point, you're not that far from a web app. Why does the web need functions and functional programming? I mean, there are plenty of frameworks. Why do we even need React or cursors for the web? Looking back at how websites, how we use websites may shed some light on what func how functional programming can help. Web apps started with the concept of a user looking at some information on a page, then moving to another page to see this information. Click on a link, paste in a URL, look at the content, and then move on to another page. Eventually, frameworks like Rails helped us to develop web applications that would put more content on our pages. After scrolling through a list of 20 to 50 items, we could click a button to move to the next page. For these apps and frameworks, traditional MVC was kind of the way we did things. But as the web has become more of a focus in our daily lives, we're looking, we're looking at a new set of items. When we look at a new set of items, we don't really want to turn a page anymore, but we prefer to have infinite scroll. We don't even want to have a page. In fact, we don't even want to turn pages or have the concept of a page. We're forcing more and more of our activity into this view of a single page. The web frameworks we use to build these complicated views are now responsible for more work. MVC might have brought us here, but if we let go of MVC, we think it'll be easier to understand as an application as a series of composable pieces. These composable pieces are small, and by combining to the get by combining them together in different ways, we can build new functionality without having to make new components. 
We think that web frameworks that embrace functional programming will help us keep up with the demands of the web. One of these frameworks is React. React uses functional programming concepts. Unlike other frameworks, React focuses on the view layer. It isn't as opinionated on how to structure applications beyond the view. How does React accomplish this? Let's go back to our function for just a moment. We've talked about how functions are a black box, but we could use another name for them. In fact, React has another name for this exact same concept, a component. A React component is similar in concept to a pure function. React components must have a render method. When render is called, React draws HTML in the browser. In most web frameworks, there's a, separ a separation of logic from templates. React takes a different approach. React applications are the combination of many modular components that have a single responsibility. Instead of making one large complex component, you want to make many smaller, simpler components that can be combined. Aside from composition, this gives you the added benefit of working solely in JavaScript. There is no templating language. It's just code. All of the components are JavaScript functions. The inputs to a React component are called props. They are the same as function parameters. Given the same set of props, a React component renders the same HTML. You can re-render the component as many times as you want. Given the same props, the output is the same. Typically, React components are idempotent, like pure functions. React components also have the concept of state. State can be changed by a component and passed to a child components. When either props or state change, the component is re-rendered. React is essentially reacting to changes in props and state. If you like functions and functional programming, you're going to like React. Here's an example of a web app made from many components. It's a pretty standard to-do app. As you can see, there's a header, some to-do items, and a few buttons that let us interact with the app. Having a look at the front end, we can easily break this app into components. React encourages the use of these components to break down view behavior into simpler building blocks. This type of composition makes it easier to share the code. Drawing boxes around different pieces of the app helps us to think about the component boundaries and ownership. React has a declarative syntax that it uses in components called JSX. JSX makes it easy to model the layout of the components. But part of what makes React great is the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM in React allows it to detect operations in the real DOM based on changes to a component. The virtual DOM behavior is a performance optimization. And this is enough for most applications. By most applications, we, we mean ones that don't render frequently and have few DOM nodes, such as a page of static content on Wikipedia. But not everything is a static page on the web. We browse through a list of movies, each one giving us a preview without even clicking. We scroll through photos that respond to our movements. And that response to animations. We navigate through menus that reconfigure themselves based on our choices. A highly interactive application will need mo much more than just the virtual DOM to perform well. If we want our application to be fast, we need to only render the real changes. To understand this, let's talk about the limits of React's out-of-the-box performance on the virtual DOM. Here is a large list of items to render. If we add an item to that list without any optimizations, 
React will still call render 10,001 times. When it attempts to apply those changes to the DOM, it will actually only add one new item to that list. This is 10,000 wasted renders. But we don't have to do this. Instead, we want to detect the exact number of changes and not have wasted renders. The amount of work we do in the virtual DOM should match what our components render. The number of times React renders should be the same as the number of things we are actually changing. In our case of 10,000 items, the re-render would only draw one new item. React uses immutability to optimize the virtual DOM. We can use the same technique to optimize our component renders. With proper detection of changes, there are no wasted renders. The beauty of implementing this internal React optimization for our own components is that it plays to one of, Javas of JavaScript's particular strengths, references and comparison by reference. References are fast, cheap, and when used with comparison, are a powerful tool for performance optimization. Let's take a brief look at references in JavaScript. Anna and Bella are references to the same person, Annabelle. References that point to the same thing are equal. When a reference points to something else, it's not equal. References are important because they give us a way to check for changes in an immutable object. What do we mean by immutability? Immutability is the state of being unchangeable in the memory after creation. We can think of immutability the way we think of memories, like a baby's first words. A baby will say a lot of words after the first one, but the first one will always be immutable. When we talk about an object being immutable, we mean that the object in its current state cannot be changed. You get a new copy of the object with the change you wanted. For the purpose of this talk, we're going to focus on the ability to detect changes with immutable data structures. What exactly does this mean? Clearly, A is different from B. It has an extra number. How can JavaScript check that these two arrays are different? Well, there are different ways to do this. One way is to iterate through every element of both arrays and check that the numbers are the same. Another way is to compare the references to these objects as long as they are immutable. Let's take a look at ex of an example of immutability in JavaScript using two different array methods. First, we'll use the method push, which modifies the original array. By inserting a new number into the array, we're mutating it. Push is an operation that's mutable. It's not possible to know that the array is different by comparing the reference because it's the same as before. Next, let's look at adding an item to the array with concat. This returns a new array with the number added. This is an example of an operation that's immutable. The original array is not mutated by the concat operation. What's interesting about this is that we can tell what's changed because of references. But what gets a reference in this array? We know that the numbers 1 and 2 did not change because they are the same references. 3 is a new reference, so we know that it has changed. 
Also, we know that the array has changed because it's a new array. We can count the number of reference changes between the operation. We can see that the, the two changes are the ones that are actually what happens in the concat. Remember, comparing references in JavaScript is fast. In fact, it's the fastest way to do change detection. We don't have to loop through each item in an array to detect changes. When a reference is different, we know the object is different and that the object has changed. When the reference is the same, we know that the object has not changed. Even though references in JavaScript are fast and cheap, JavaScript has pretty poor support for immutable operations. Since it was never designed with immutability in mind, most operations in JavaScript are, are mutable, and it's hard to tell what operations are actually causing mutations to the data. Cursors can help us use immutability for data in JavaScript using references. We'll need to use immutability to get most of one-way data flow in React. But before we get too deep into React's one-way data flow, let's think about what one-way data flow really is. To do this, let's think about a set of components, what those components are trying to render and the ownership involved. Take the checkboxes in our to-do app, for example. What happens when we check a box? Who owns that? Who is the parent? Who are the children? The most intuitive way to think about it is that each checkbox owns its own state. In that case, what are the props of this checkbox? What is its state? Because each checkbox is responsible for itself, there is no need for props. There is only the state of the checkbox and whether or not it is checked. What if we want to check all of the boxes with a new component? We need to be able to change the state of all the checkboxes, but right now they can only change themselves. They have no view into what is happening with the other checkboxes. To add the ability to check all boxes at once, we need to move this responsibility to a parent component. We are saying that the parent component owns the state of all checkboxes. Since the parent owns the state of all checkboxes, each checkbox state is passed to the component it corresponds to as props. Now the parent can tell each checkbox what to do instead. The child has no control. The child can only render the props the parent passes down to it. But each checkbox still needs to change when you click it. How do we do this if the state does not live in the checkbox? The parent passes a function down to the child, which can be called when the checkbox is toggled. This function is effectively an intention the parent is giving to the child. This function can be used to apply the intention at the right time. That is, it can be used to check the checkbox when the child is clicked. One-way data flow is about having all of the state at the top of your application and the intentions passed down to your components. This is the pattern that emerges. This is the one-way data flow. Flowing downward from parent to child. This is what we want. Instead of passing props and intentions to children, however, we prefer to package them together. Cursors are the mechanism for packaging props and intentions. Cursors have been recently popularized by the ClojureShip framework Ohm. They assist with traversing an object and updating a data structure that's immutable, which is normally difficult in JavaScript. We're going to discuss a simplified cursor for this talk. The cursors we're going to talk about today have two concepts. The first part of a cursor is the data that it points to. The second part of the cursor describes what happens when you want to update it. The cursor points to a data structure and gives you access to the different parts of that data structure. The cursor also allows you to update that data structure. Certain immutable operations, like push, set, merge, and splice could be used. 
for example. We're going to focus on push. Notice, in this example, we're constructing a cursor not only with an array, but with a callback. The callback will be important in just a minute. In this example, push is called on the cursor. It doesn't change the original data, but creates a new cursor and a new copy of that original data with the change applied. This is where the callback in a cursor is used. The callback of the cursor is called with the new copy of the data. The callback is then used to update the state of the application. By combining our change to the data with a callback, the cursor allows us to package up data flow in React. Whenever the underlying data structure is changed by a cursor, whenever the cursors are updated, the re-rendering cycle is initiated through the callback, and all of the components in the React application redraw. Each change represents a single drawing cycle. Each drawing cycle is a state This is the same square we've been talking about all along. Pure functions, pure render. At any given point, we can inspect the state of the application. The same props as input renders into the same HTML. But this is one square. This function is a single moment in time. Our application state plays out over time in state after state after state. A single state always corresponds to a single drawing cycle. This gives us the ability to replay the history of an application over time. The application is completely predictable which means it's easier for us to understand what is happening at any given time. This is the power you get from cursors and how they can help you implement React's one-way data flow and pure render. Why don't more web apps today use cursors, one-way data flow, and pure render? Immutability isn't built into JavaScript. So it's not something that anyone who's familiar with JavaScript will automatically be reaching for. But JavaScript is in the browser, and it is the language of the web. If we plan to journey with our web apps into a place that goes well beyond pages and static content, we will need to reshape our own thinking about how we build our apps and how we use JavaScript. Today, we've shown you drawing, how drawing and sketching with others is a way to shape your own thinking around complicated topics with many layers. Immutability and pure render and React can be approachable if we draw them together. It took time for us to understand cursors and their benefits. What you've seen in this talk is the two of us building up a shared understanding between us about what cursors are and why we should use them. We did this through writing code and drawing. Collaborative sketching is what brought this talk together. We hope you've enjoyed drawing with us and that the next time you're trying to understand something with your teammates, you'll give drawing a try. Thank you. <laughs>